In the winter of 1919, there were fears of revolution in many parts of the world, and people act on those fears no matter how unfounded they really are. But while all labor unrest is associated with those fears, in some arenas, particularly the world of film, trusts and monopolies are broken by determined resistance. This is Between Two Wars Season 2, a chronological summary of the interwar years, where we cover the zeitgeist, the culture, the technology, the art, the sports, and much more in the era when, for better or for worse, humanity ushered in modern times. I'm Indy Nidell. 1919 begins, and while the end of the war and the flu pandemic dominated the news across the world this past autumn, now from Beijing to Vladivostok to Moscow, Berlin, London, Paris, and San Francisco, it's revolution, civil war, labor action, and riots that top the headlines. Sure, the pandemic continues to rage on, but the autumn wave seems to be over, and so are the entrenched debates over lockdowns and quarantines. The beginning of the Paris Peace Conference does bring back the bitterness over the war, and ideas for how to forever rein in the central powers, especially Germany, or the warmongering Hun, as the papers like to call her, is all over the news. In the American state of Indiana, legislation is passed to ban from all schools the teaching of the German language. In Cincinnati, Ohio, a reporter tells of how a victory poster depicting U.S. Marines as bulldogs chasing off a German soldier as a dachshund has now seen the exit of the German dachshund from Cincinnati society dogdom after small boys have sicked bulldogs, terriers, hounds, and every other canine breed on the poor Fritzies until they have been virtually driven off the streets of Cincinnati. And although that might be a quaint, terrible little story, it is this sentiment that dominates public opinion among the Entente nations as their leaders depart for the peace conference in Paris. But the war has also brought about changes to popular culture. Live music, shared in sheet music form, is still the main way we listen to music, but the convergence of young men and women at the front lines has brought ever more music on gramophone records, and live group performances and tours abound from America to Europe. Although ragtime and then jazz has been coming on for nearly three decades already in the States, Europe is now about to enter the jazz age. In March, the original Dixieland jazz band leaves the US for England where, to huge acclaim, they will start a 15-month tour at the London Hippodrome on April 7th. They are the authors and performers of the still famous 1918 hit, Tiger Rag. And all over Europe, New American music, with its origins in the black American community, is now on high demand, or as the newspaper New York Age, reporting the French now want colored musicians, writes on February 7th, having fallen willing victims to the melody dispensed by race military bands, the music-loving public of the French capital is eager to hear a colored orchestra from the States. That is more than can be said of America itself, where although black musicians are the creators of these genres, they are performed for white audiences mainly by white musicians like, like Al Jolson. But all of that is overshadowed by the news of the Spartacist uprising in Berlin, the ever bloodier echoes of the Russian Revolution in the Russian Civil War, and what looks like threats of similar unrest soon to hit Great Britain and the US. On January 27th, many workers go on an unofficial strike in Glasgow to force the government to replace the 47-hour working week with a 40-hour one. The goal is actually to create more jobs because so many ex-servicemen have returned or tried to return to the workforce. On the 31st, an estimated 20 to 25,000 demonstrators gather in George Square in support of the campaign. It's unclear how the violence starts but it's likely thanks to a misjudged baton charge from the police. A riot soon breaks out, spreading throughout the city and into the night. The British government are worried about the onset of revolution in the city and send in around 10,000 troops accompanied by several tanks to keep the peace. 
Historians will generally agree that Britain at this time is actually a very long way from any kind of revolution, Bolshevik or otherwise. But with an eye to Berlin, many in the British government are extremely fearful of this happening. Sentiments shared by many across the Atlantic in America. Industrial disputes have been on the rise since the Great War ended. But the vast majority of these really are not intended to be revolutionary at all. The American Federation of Labor, the largest union grouping in the country, even publicly declares that their actions do not reflect radical tendencies. And their president, Samuel Gompers, consistently denounces Bolshevism, declaring that the American working class wants nothing to do with it. This does not kill the rumors that maybe workers do have a radical agenda after all. Rumors fueled by the relatively small and insignificant but outspoken union IWW, the Wobblies, who make a great deal of noise with wildcat strikes and parades. In Seattle, shipyard workers have been striking starting January in pursuit of higher wages. And the Seattle Central Labor Council is split on how to handle the conflict. In February, radical voices on the council and general anger at the stubbornness of the shipyard bosses prevail and a citywide general strike is announced. Fears run wild that a revolution is coming. Customers crowd drugstores, grocery stores, and gunsmiths to prepare for the coming emergency. And city newspapers run headlines imploring workers to call off their actions before it's too late. Many heed the plea, but on February 6th, 65,000 Seattle workers still walk off their jobs. Around 3,500 of these are members of the IWW, who distribute revolutionary material such as a pamphlet titled, Russia Did It, which reads, the Russians have shown you the way out. What are you going to do about it? You are doomed to wage slavery till you die unless you wake up realize that you and the boss have nothing in common, that the employing class must be overthrown, and that you, the workers, must take over the control of your jobs, and through them, the control over your lives. The strike is still overwhelmingly peaceful, and there is nothing even close to a descent into revolutionary chaos. But Seattle Mayor Ole Hansen is convinced that the strike is an attempt by the IWW to destroy the United States and create a new Soviet America. On February 10th, he warns the strike committee that if they don't call off their action, he will use federal troops to crush them. The union leadership, who are overwhelmingly not radical, are also fearful of a coming revolution and increasingly discouraged by the huge negative press the strike is getting. They decide to call the whole thing off from February 11th. Hansen is soon celebrated nationwide as the man of the hour and is rocketed to celebrity status. Within a few months, he will quit his job as mayor and tour the country to give lectures on the dangers of Bolshevism, earning himself $38,000 in just a matter of months. His annual wage as mayor is $7,500. The Seattle general strike is the first trigger for the Red Scare that will soon sweep the country. Already on February 4th, after news of the coming strike is announced, the U.S. Senate votes to expand the work of the Overman Judicial Subcommittee. Originally set up in September 1918 to investigate domestic pro-German elements, the Senate vote now gives it the mandate to investigate Bolshevik activity. The subcommittee begins a month of hearings on Bolshevism. Two dozen witnesses, most of them strongly anti-Bolshevik, testify. They speak of how the Red Army is an army of criminals and how the revolution is engineered by Jews from New York's east side. Some tell harrowing tales of Soviet decrees, abolishing private property, nationalizing industry, and shockingly, establishing free love bureaus. Bureaus, that's an interesting thing, an interesting choice of words. They go to the Bureau of Free Love. It's not like a free love group or free love Soviet, right? That seems more Bolshevik, free love bureau. So, like, yeah, yeah, bureau, yeah, the bureaucracy. You got, oh, you got to fill out this paperwork. Well, when do I get the free love? No, you got to fill this up and you got to come back next Tuesday. You got to interview. And then after the interview, you get recommended to the, to the group leader and then he'll recommend you to join one. It's a bureaucracy. But it's free love in the end. <clears throat> well, anyhow, 
When the subcommittee releases its report in early March, it will declare that communism is the greatest threat America currently faces. It recommends further legislation on alien exclusion and deportation, and an increase in patriotic propaganda to neutralize the coming danger. More of this government action is on the way. Both the fear of revolution and the actual revolutions are part of a greater undercurrent of change. It's been steadily rising for almost two centuries with the ideas of liberalism born during the enlightenment of the 18th century, the early democratic ideals that drive the American and French revolutions, the ideas of, of gender and class emancipation born in the mid 19th century, and the dichotomy of abolition of slavery in the West and the parallel rise of racism. The close to irreconcilable economic differences between the small upper classes and the middle and working classes, the inequality of opportunity and rights between the genders, the social disparity between colonial subjects and their masters, the ethnic and racial conflicts inside and between nations leave the huge majority of the world population wanting for freedom and more participation in society. All of these things are about to clash in one place as world leaders, well, the leaders of the nations that did not lose the world war, meet in Paris. They arrive with the idea of cementing world peace. But as we saw in season one, they will fail to turn this goal into practical policies. But the winds of change will not be stoppable. And although it will be a very, very bumpy road, the next hundred years will continue to be a march towards more freedom, more equality, and more democracy. Undoubtedly, like the printing press eventually launched the Reformation in the 16th century, the advent of modern mass media will be the vehicle for the new ideas of the 20th. As we saw in 1918, it is at this point mainly the motion picture industry that is driving this revolution. And there too, the people doing the actual work want more of a say in things. Now that the Edison Trust is no more, the stars join emerging independent studios like Warner in the opportunity to seize financial and creative control over their work. On February 5th, the biggest star in 1919, Charlie Chaplin, the much admired and much sought after movie star Mary Pickford and the male reserved sex symbol and character actor Douglas Fairbanks launch United Artists together with director and producer D.W. Griffith. Under the monopoly of the trust, there was a tightening of control over actors' salaries and creative decisions. So these, America's biggest stars, decide to go it alone. However, without external financing, their fledgling studio's film financing is limited to the prepayments they get from movie theaters for upcoming films, meaning production is slower and budgets more limited. Still, their first produced film, His Majesty the American, released later this year and starring Fairbanks, will be a rousing success and United Artists will from now on release about five films per year. There is something new in print as well. Champs and Chumps, a cartoon feature by Robert Ripley, premiered last December in the New York Globe. Initially, it's only about sporting feats, but that will soon change, as will the name, as it becomes Ripley's Believe It or Not. And whether people in early 1919 believe it or not, despite the number of cases dropping around the new year, the flu pandemic is not over. In North America, two ice hockey teams, the Montreal Canadiens and the Seattle Metropolitans, are in the playoffs for the Stanley Cup, and the sixth match of the finals is scheduled for April 1st. On the eve of the match, Five of the Montreal players come down with the flu, and only hours before game time, the game is called off. Montreal manager George Kennedy announces they're forfeiting the cup to Seattle, but Pete Muldoon, manager of the Metropolitans, refuses to accept. Finally, it is decided that for the first and still in 2020, so far only time in its history, the cup is not awarded. One of the Montreal players, Joe Hall, dies of the flu four days later. By that time, Kennedy is sick too, and although he seems to recover, he will die from the lasting effects of the virus in 1921. And so ends the winter of 1919, with a catastrophic loss of life from war and disease, 
but also fears of revolution everywhere, some with little basis in reality. Technology and pop culture are making the world smaller and smaller, and cinema is captivating audiences in the midst of all this turmoil. Who could have ever dreamed this? That this is the modern world. This is the post-war. Believe it or not. If you'd like to learn about the League of Nations and the troubles it went through, then you can check out our season one episode on that and on appeasement right here. Our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Bruce Quam. It is because of you, Bruce, and the other Army members that we can present this awesome series and everything else we do. So if you want us to carry on doing this and more, join the Time Ghost Army yourself at patreon.com or timeghost.tv and... As art critic Dave Hickey once wrote, Jazz presumes that it would be nice if the four of us, simpatico dudes that we are, while playing this complicated song together, might somehow be free and autonomous as well. Tragically, this never quite works out. Cheers, all you hepcats. Cheers. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm.